the three fundamental mysteries about our place in the universe have already been solved. The first was literally about our place in the universe. This is a, a photograph taken by Voyager 1 on its journey out of the solar system from a distance of about, I think, six billion uh, kilometers. And all of human history, in fact, all of the history of life on this planet took place on that pale blue dot. That's the famous pale blue dot photo. That's the Earth from far away. Now, this just emphasizes the point that we've known since Copernicus that we are not at the center of the universe. We're just a tiny speck suspended somewhere out there in the abyss. You know, we're not so central. The second mystery is about our relationship to other forms of life. And Darwin pointed out that, again, we're not so special. We're related to all other creatures. And we're just uh, some branch or some twig of a beautifully rich and delicate evolutionary tree, sharing much of the machinery of life with even uh, the simplest of our fellow creatures. And the third mystery is the mystery of our inner universe. And that's the mystery of consciousness. Now, consciousness... For me, it's always been absolutely fascinating. It's the one thing that cannot be an illusion. We could be mistaken about everything else. We could be mistaken about the existence of the external world at all, what it's made of, whether it's there. I could be mistaken. I could even be mistaken about, you know, not wanting Brexit to happen. But you know, I could be mistaken <laughs> about st things that's so fundamental, but I can't be mistaken about the fact that right now I'm having a conscious experience. People might want to question that, but we'll hold questions at the end. Um, if you disagree with that, we'll, we'll be in trouble. I mean, I think... Um, um, well, I'm glad about that. Even if it's... See, but you'd be surprised, actually, that, that quite a number of philosophers have spent a lot of ink trying to argue that we can be mistaken about the fact that we are conscious, um, which I think goes down as one of the, the sort of silliest sort of forms of philosophy that, that I've come across. And, you know, we, even if it seems like we're conscious, that's enough. We have a, I don't know whether you are, but I certainly know that I am conscious right now. How does this happen? This is another of the central mysteries that we face. And it's similar to the other mysteries in the sense that it's challenging in some way our perceived importance in the universe which is one reason, I think, this is something to bear in mind through the talk, this is one reason why people are often resistant to a scientific account of consciousness, because just like Copernicus, just like Darwin, it sort of naturalizes what we find most special about ourselves, and some people don't like that. And I think by the end of the talk, I'll hope to convince you that that's not something to be worried about, it's something we should uh, rejoice in. But this is the third mystery, how does consciousness happen? You know, somehow, within each of our brains, the combined activity of many billions of neurons is giving rise to a conscious experience. And not just any experience, your experience right here and right now. How does this happen? Why is life in the first person? So the brain is really a remarkable object. If there's anything that's going to do something remarkable, maybe it's the brain. It's not so much the number of neurons. There are about 88 billion at the last count. It's not even really the number of connections, though there are so many connections in the brain that if you counted one every second, it would take you about three million years to finish counting. It's more the intricate patterns of connectivity that are still not fully known, but within which are inscribed everything that makes you, you. Now, you'll sometimes hear, and I often hear, that we know nothing about how the brain and body give rise to consciousness, that there's this uncrossable explanatory gap between conscious experience and the physical world. The origin of this view is often traced to Descartes, who back in the, in the Enlightenment, some hundreds of years ago, he divided the universe into two things. On the one side, there's res extensa, the stuff that things are made of, material stuff, the stuff that tables, chairs are made of, the stuff that bodies and indeed brains are also made of. And on the other side, there's res cogitans, the stuff of thought, um, of the realm of the mental and the realm of conscious experience. And by dividing the universe into this way, he generated the problem of how you put them back together again, uh, the philosophy of dualism, and nothing was ever uh, the same or simple since then. And Descartes' own preferred solution, some of you may have heard, was the pineal gland. The pineal gland is this part of the brain, deep in the middle of it, 
that was supposed to be this interface between these two realms of existence. Um, now, this is a kind of a strange idea. Certainly, the pineal gland is reasonably important, but it's not the seat of the soul. Probably the reason Descartes chose it was that unlike most parts of the brain, there's only one of them, because it's right in the middle. Most of our brain is sort of, you know, we have left and right hemispheres, you find structures on both sides. So if you're looking for a place where one realm of the universe interfaces with another, it's sort of parsimonious to only have one of them rather than two. Uh, but that's probably the only good reason, if it's a good reason, for the pineal gland. Um, but this view then that, uh, this dualistic view that on the one hand you have consciousness and mind, on the other hand you have physical material, this has persisted in science and more latterly in psychology and neuroscience for a very long time. I started my undergraduate in the early 90s and just before I started, um, fortunately I didn't read this at the time, in the International Dictionary of Psychology, the International Dictionary of Psychology, Stuart Sutherland, who is the founding professor of psychology at my current University of Sussex, said this. He said, consciousness is a fascinating but elusive phenomenon. It's impossible to specify what it is, what it does, or why it evolved. <laughs> Nothing worth reading has been written on it. <laughs> this is quite a depressing state of affairs. Uh, to be sort of canonized into the, in the dictionary of psychology. But this indeed was, was the environment at the time. I mean, I remember studying psychology and neuroscience in the early 90s in, in Cambridge, and it was really not allowed to discuss consciousness. You know, maybe you could talk about memory and attention, uh, and perception, but not consciousness. That's philosophy or religion. Um, this is another, these, these cartoons, I, I'm very grateful to Jolyon Trishanko, who's done all these beautiful cartoons about neuroscience. This is another sort of idea about the impossibility of saying anything sensible about consciousness, that you can talk about, and maybe hopefully, hopefully this won't happen by the end of this talk, um, but you, know, you can have somebody talk about as, as much about neurons as they want, but there will still be some magic process by which it all alchemically is transformed into the redness of red or the sharpness of a pain or the actual experience of what, you know, the, the fundamental nature of a conscious experience. And I'm not saying this mystery has gone away at all. Um, but what I want to convey during this talk is that we shouldn't worry too much about uh, this mystery, about how consciousness, you know, why it's part of our universe in the first place, so long as we can do a good job of explaining its properties scientifically. Um, and in, indeed, this is, you know, the times have changed, and over the last 25 years, there's been a, a rehabilitation, a resurgence, and now first a trickle, and now quite a deluge of scientific work on consciousness. This is uh, my lab from a year or two ago. If you come to my lab and many others around, you find scientists of all different disciplines. The Niall said it nicely in the introduction. I mean, we work with uh, physicists, mathematicians, virtual reality engineers, neuroscientists, psychiatrists, and philosophers, all trying to understand how consciousness works and, and what happens when it goes wrong get to this at the end, but studying consciousness is not only interesting because it's one of the greatest remaining mysteries, it's also, I believe, of enormous practical importance for the insights it can give us into uh, things like depression, other psychiatric um, disorders, which uh, for, the, for the moment, for the most part, don't benefit from a very rich mechanistic understanding of what's going on in the same way that other branches of medicine do. Um, philosophy. Um, and the approach that we take, and the approach I want to argue for today, is to treat uh, consciousness a little bit like life. Now, this is an, uh, an analogy that's been used many times. It's an imperfect analogy, but I think it's still valuable. Now, it wasn't that long ago that eminent <laughs> biochemists thought that life could never be explained in terms of mere mechanism that how much you understood about a material system, there was something special, very special about living systems that required some special source, some elan vital, some spark of life, that would account for the difference between the animate and the inanimate. But as biologists got on with the job of accounting for the properties of living systems, things like metabolism, reproduction, and homeostasis, in terms of physics and chemistry, the basic mystery of what life is started to fade away. Now, we don't understand everything about life. People don't really know how a cell works. 
But this basic metaphysical sense of the unknown, that, we, that, that life is in principle beyond mechanistic explanation, now that has faded away. People no longer think that that mystery is as mysterious as it once was. And the hope is that, as with life, the same thing uh, will happen with consciousness. That as we start to account for its properties in terms of things happening inside brains and bodies, the basic mystery of what consciousness is will also start to fade away and people will worry about it less. And the reason I, th- I mean, I'll give you some examples of how this is actually happening. Uh, but then, and I'll return at the end, I think, to some of the ways in which people still resist this, this approach. Why do we still think there's something, you know, there's going to be some residue left? I mean, if you think about it, even physics. Physics is probably the, the best example of a science that's able to shed enormous insight into the way things are in, in ways that are very counterintuitive, but also very predictive, very explanatory. But physics still doesn't tell us why there is a universe versus not. It's still, you know, we don't really know what matter is. There are still some basic things in the domain of physics that remain mysterious, but that hasn't stopped physics revealing a great deal about the nature of the world we live in, and I think the same uh, will turn out to be true um, consciousness. Now, there's another way to put this, which I want to flag, um, since some of you may have heard of this, and this is a sort of the, the, the more recent incarnation of the Cartesian divide, this divide into res extensa and res cogitans. This is between what people have been calling, uh, following the Australian philosopher David Chalmers, the easy problem and the hard problem. How many people have heard about this, this distinction, easy problem, hard problem? Um, a few of you. Okay. Can you say what? Psychosynthesis. Okay, we can talk about that later. Um, <laughs> So, for Chalmers, he, he, in a very influential set of papers about 20 years ago, he distinguished between the so-called easy problems of consciousness and the hard problem. Now, the easy problems are not easy at all. They're incredibly difficult. But they're basically the problems of figuring out how the brain does what it does, how it works, how its complicated circuitry underwrites all the functional capacities that we humans and other animals have, how we perceive how we use perception to guide action, how we make decisions, um, things that you can measure from the outside, uh, what reports we would say about what we see. But basically, the easy problem is, is about figuring out how brains do what they do in ways which we can observe, validate from the outside as external observers. The hard problem is figuring out how and why any of this should have anything to do with conscious experience at all. You know, that magic step. Why are the lights on rather than off? How do conscious experiences qualia, as the philosophers say, why and how do they come about given any kind of explanation of the activity of neurons or neurotransmitters or whatever level of detail you want to go into? How and why should that ever generate the redness of red? That's, that's the hard problem. Um, for David Chalmers. And the intuition here is that solving the easy problem, figuring out how brains do what they do, would leave us completely in the dark about the hard problem, that no explanation in terms of mechanisms, neurons or anything would shed any light on this hard problem of how and why consciousness happens. Now, there's already this analogy with life. I hope you can see that. that yeah, it's, it's pretty, I think, unproductive to make claims about what we still can't understand when we haven't done the hard work of trying to understand. Um, and it also cleaves the problem in an unhelpful way. So with sort of slightly to annoy David Chalmers, I've been talking about what I call the real problem of consciousness. The real problem is the problem of accounting for phenomenological properties. That's properties of consciousness in terms of mechanisms. So it's not the easy problem because the easy problem focuses on behavioral and functional things, things you can measure from the outside. So I want to try to explain properties of what conscious experiences are like. What's the difference between a visual experience and an olfactory experience and an emotional experience and an experience of free will or volition? So it's targeting properties of consciousness. And it's not the hard problem either because in order to do this, it's not necessary to explain how and why consciousness comes to be part of the universe in the first place. We know that it exists, we're all conscious, 
so we can map its properties onto properties of mechanisms, begin to explain them. If you can explain, predict, and control, you've basically done everything that a scientific approach can do. Um, so there is uh, one of the things you can maybe look at if, if you're interested after the talk is there's a sort of public article in E.ON, uh, which is an online magazine called The Real Problem, which sort of argues for this in a bit more detail. But the question that's motivated me in my research over the last couple of decades is how can the structure and dynamics of the brain, together with the body and environment, account for the subjective phenomenological properties of consciousness? So that's the question. So we're trying to map mechanism, not just of the brain, but also appreciating that if we want to understand anything really about mind in general, but consciousness specifically, brains don't exist in isolation. They're continually interacting with the body, which is embedded in um, the world. Brains are embodied and bodies are embedded. And we need to understand these, um, these interactions too. And how can those interactions shed some light on what it is like to have this experience or that experience? So that's the question.